Okay, online people, welcome. Um, we run in a Harvard event, so we have uh, people in the TIPS office um, in person. Uh, we have one of the presenters and the chair in person, and we've got two of our presenters and lots of people online. Um, I suppose it's a, a new way of doing things that we're going to get used to, um, and uh, we'll, we'll get sick at it over time. <laughs> Uh, but it is good to have uh, people in the office before it was all virtual. Um, and we, we've only recently started doing these things um, in, in a hybrid way. So, so welcome everyone to our development dialogue on load shedding and the implication for industrial policy, how to make the economy more resilient. Um, for those who are online, if you can't hear something clearly, um, please um, put in the chat or say something we will be moderating the, the online um, so that if people accidentally unmute themselves and start having conversations or the dogs barking uh, we will we will um, assist with muting um, if you in, in the room and you start having conversations on your cell phone you will you turn it off okay so uh, <laughs> Thanks everyone. Um, we've got um, three speakers today. So our first one is um, Tafalzwa uh, Chibanguza, who's from uh, CIFSA, um, previously at the Minerals Council, and um, will be talking about their uh, research report that they've done. We've also got um, uh, Silas Mbalawutsi from SELGA, um, who um, has experience um, at local government and um, at the um, Department of Energy. And he's been talking about the, the work that they've done at CELGA and um, also on this topic. And then our last speaker is Neva Mafeta from TIPS, who has a research report on the TIPS website, um, trying to better understand um, these issues and how they impact on firms. So, so we've got three good, good pieces of work that help us and get a better understanding. We be vexed with um, quite a big problem here where um, the, the impact of the electricity crisis is difficult for manufacturing firms to, to get around. So there is some resilience that people have got generators. Many can't um, shift to renewables because of the size of the, um, the electricity requirements or load that they require. And the, the diesel's cost. And um, in my conversations that I've had with a few manufacturers, um, it's we, we're keeping the lights on, but we we're not generating profit because of the cost of the diesel. So so these are very difficult um, times for manufacturers, and it's a sector that we know that we need to grow, support. Um, it creates good, decent jobs. It um, creates a lot of other benefits for the economy to have a thriving manufacturing sector. So it, it is something we need to better understand and try and understand what is the impact on, on all of um, you know, for the country and in particular for the land department. So uh, we, we do have some representatives uh, from Treasury, from DTRC, and I'm hoping from other government departments. Um, we, we used to do a round robin of everyone, but if there's 65 people online and um, about 20 in the room, um, it's going to be quite difficult to do that. So um, I think when we ask people to open up um, and, and people speak, if they can just introduce themselves and their department or their organization or company or department that they're in, um, so that when we open up for the dialogue, um, we, we, we're able to see who's um, in the physical and virtual room. Um, as is typical with dialogues, we encourage people in the audience to also add their views. Um, the, the people who are presenting have done work in the space, but they're also experts in the audience. So um, we are um, interested in what people in the audience are saying, and that's the nature of a dialogue. It's not a seminar presentation, it's a dialogue, and we're looking to get the, the knowledge and expertise from those that are in the room uh, physically and virtually um, and, and get their insights as well. Um, we, we will make um, all the presentations from um, the session available um, through the TIPS website um, and we'll also have a recording of the seminar dialogue um, on the TIPS website and um, 
we, we are looking forward to, to the three presentations. Let me then hand over to our first speaker, Thanks, uh, over to you. Thanks, uh, Saul, and good uh, morning to all the participants and delegates. Um, I'll just briefly switch on my camera just to greet uh, while I put up the presentation. Uh, I've put together some few slides, and really what we are looking at here is the, um, the, uh, a piece of work that we recently commissioned on the uh, back of uh, uh, a report quest from our board to look at the energy crisis. And I think Saul, you, you, you very, um, uh, you, you are very correct in your, in your um, introduction that um, this energy crisis possibly presents the most binding constraint on the sector, on this economy. And, um, and what this work that we did uh, and commissioned, what it allows us to do is put some numbers to that. So I'll run through that very quickly. The first uh, slide or two just really introduce CIFSA. For those who are not familiar with CIFSA, we're an employer federation uh, representing 18 associations. So the associations are members. And then those manufacturers, those associations in turn represent in excess of 1,300 companies who employ 170,000 people. This year, we celebrate eight years. And uh, maybe just by way of introducing the metals and engineering sector, it constitutes 26% of manufacturing, 2.6% of GDP, uh, 900 billion rand in turnover. And the entire sector employs 374,000 people um, who are employed in about 10,000 companies. So that's sort of the representation when we talk metals and engineering. I'll get into a bit more detail in a second. But um, that's sort of the broader sort of one line about the metals and engineering uh, sector and CIFSA. We will make these presentations uh, available, but what this does is just gives you a snap overview of um, uh, the sector. It's a dashboard that we use everywhere where, where, where we talk about the sector. I've already referred to some of the numbers um, around the turnover, employment, et cetera. So this will be for later reading, but it gives you a good snapshot over medium term, which is 2020 to 2022 um, on these different variables. So perhaps in a bit more detail, um, I've already mentioned that steel and engineering constitutes 26% of manufacturing. And in there, you could call this the backbone of uh, industrialization, the sector that we represent. So what you will notice is that typically, I guess it's also in the name. Uh, when we refer to steel and engineering sector, people often think just the steel sector, which is the upstream um, just after mining, which is who we represent. And then also, but very importantly, as a federation, we then represent also the downstream, which is heavy and light engineering. So it's important to keep that context in mind when, when we refer to uh, the steel light is the fact that uh, this definition of the sector is per as per our metal um, and engineering industries bargaining count. Council. So under that bargaining council is where the, the sector is, um, is defined. We then link this up to the standard industrial classification codes, as well as all other macro data to give a snapshot of where the sector is or what, what, what constitutes the different variables in the sector. So um, I think enough about this uh, slide, but now you get a general sense of the entire value chain. And the important point, as I said, it is the backbone of industrialization. So in compiling this load shedding impact assessment, as I've said, really what we're looking to do is put some tangible numbers to the fact that we know um, it become almost cliche or, or obvious that the uh, electricity crisis presents a major binding constraint on the economy. Um, what this survey then allowed us to do is put some numbers to it. So um, what you have is the reference period that we surveyed our, uh, our members who responded was February 2022 to February 2023. Which is quite interesting. We'll, you'll see when we look at the alternative energy sources that uh, that 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 have been invested in, um, you will notice that the cutoff is just before the solar incentives did come up, but also the load capacities that are consumed in the sector also don't make solar the most viable option. But we do think with the incentives that were then announced in the budget speech end of February and for 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 implementation one April. Um, should contribute to having that uh, solar deployed. Uh, but of course, just bear in mind that cutoff uh, of this period that we surveyed the members was uh, Feb 2023. 
Um, average company size is 184 employees. And in there, we had a very good mix of large, small, and medium companies. And that 184 company size being the straight average company size also gives us a, 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 a quite a nice size of, of, of company size. Also in there, maybe just for defining the parameters of the, of the, of the sample, um, in total, 206 companies operating in this sector re responded to the survey. They in turn employ 37,000 employees, and that constitutes 10% of the sector um, from an employee headcount. But if we look at it in terms of our members who we represent, it's about 26%. But what we're going with is the 9.9 uh, 9 .9 or call it 10% as the, as the broader statistic in terms of the representation of this, uh, of this uh, survey. Importantly then to highlight is that we then use in, in consolidating the stats, especially the relative stats, we then use this employment number as the main pivot for how we aggregated the stats. And then, of course, the absolute numbers are, are straight absolute numbers, a tally of the responses that were made. So what I will do, um, and, and, and maybe I should just make the point also that so we surveyed the production, we surveyed um, the, the members in terms of the impact of load shedding on uh, production, on employment, on input costs, investment, as well as we look uh, just briefly at what type of alternative energy sources the companies invested in. So what I will do with each variable that I present across those five or the four really, is that I will first give you where we are in terms of the historic trends of that variable. And then I will then highlight what the impact assessment um, and numbers are, are, are churning out. So broadly from a production and capacity utilization, which is the first, first variable that we looked at, what we do see is that the sector on a production basis has been in a multi-year decline. Um, and over this period that I'm referring to also, and that multi-year multi, multi -year, uh, decline in production has been since 2008. And since that point, um, there hasn't been much demand in the economy. So we've seen a persistent uh, downward trajectory, as you see on the, on the top uh, graph um, in, in the production trends. That has been measured at about 1.2% on a compound annual basis. And also at this point, um, even from a recovery point of view, the sector is still below its pre-COVID levels by about 1.6%. Um, uh, sorry, it's still above its uh, 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 COVID levels by about 1.6%. And also we have an adaptive moving average, which we constantly update, and the sector is still operating below that level. So we are talking a sector already in, in crisis from a production point of view predominantly because demand has been weak in the economy. Um, the, this is just some stats around um, the production trends on a month-on-month -month basis. What's important to highlight is the upstream here where you see basic iron and steel product. You see a deterioration in production and that's a very energy intensive part of the sector. And during the course of 2022, as we saw the grid deteriorating, we also saw a very um, um, strong proxy for the, the, the energy intensive side also deteriorating. So you'll see uh, the, the, the negatives that were highlighted, that, that were recorded here in the basic iron and steel. The lower down you go the value chain, which is in the engineering uh, products, the, 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 the consumption is relatively sm well, small, but relative to the upstream, which is very energy intensive. So their diesel can generators can be deployed and we'll talk a bit about that. So in that sense, production remained relatively um, um, at level in the downstream sectors where they can deploy alternative energy, but the upstream where they are reliant on, 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 on ESCOM and the grid, you see that deterioration coming in the production trends. So when you then look at the production the, the responses from those companies in terms of the impact of production on 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 impact on production from the energy um, um, uh, crisis, uh, the the response that they came through the weighted response was a decline of thirty four point two percent decline in production um, over that reference period that I mentioned. Um, across these uh, companies that I, uh, I've referred to who, who highlighted this. So with these relative stats, one can then apply it at a more sectoral level. Um, it's the absolute numbers where we can play around with some assumptions. So 
Initially, when we started 2022, we do a piece of work that is called the State of the Sector Report, um, where we look at the industry, where we are and where we are going into. And we started 2022, we, we ran some of um, uh, the numbers. And initially, we started the year, this is pre-doing this survey. And what we what we what we were putting down at the time when we when we look at the external and domestic environment, also factoring in some load shedding intensive assumptions, our base case was for the sector, the production in the sector to contract by about 2.2% um, in the in the calendar year 2023. That was our initial base case. But having then completed this load shedding impact assessment and plugging in the numbers that we, ha we have here from a production decline that I've highlighted at 34, that overall forecast for the year and, and plugging into this, this model that you see in front of you right now on the table, that outlook has now deteriorated to minus 5.3% um, being the view for 2023, largely a function of the um, uh, energy intensity this is when we factor in the 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 this is when we factor in the survey results into that uh, into that model so already we see an impact on on pro, on 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 on, on on um, um, uh, a production for for the year that we are going into we then also look at the same on employment. Um, again, the historic stats on employment. What we are seeing, the broad point I will say, is um, we've seen a deterioration in excess of two, uh, let's say, two hundred fifty thousand employees um, in in the sector over the period that I've referenced to two thousand and eight to now. So already that multi-year decline in production has also resulted resulted in a decline in employment. So that's the historic picture. An interesting point to highlight is that what we are also seeing is that um, there is a divergence, or maybe divergence is not the right word, there is, um, there is a, a weakening of the relationship between production and employment. So put differently, for for increases in production are no longer a necessary condition um, or, or as strong a necessary condition for in increases in employment uh, growth. In fact, we see many instances where production does recover, for example, after the COVID period, but employment not to the same extent. So already that's a structural uh, point to consider. Um, we saw that in 2008 and the COVID period as well. Now, when we look at the responses from the survey um, uh, in terms of impact on employment, um, uh, uh, the question was, have you had to cut um, employment uh, as a result of the um, challenges presented by the energy crisis? 24% uh, of the company said, yes, they have. Um, the weighted average decline is about a quarter of employment, of employees that were uh, uh, um, reduced as a result of the energy crisis is the response that the companies are giving. That number is 9,432. Bearing in mind, this is that absolute number I was talking about only from 206 companies. So if you then would, and 10% of the sector. So if you want to expand this, the theoretical way would be to expand this by 10, just to give a sense. But of course, that's uh, probably not the most accurate method, but just think of those absolute numbers and that we are representing 10% of the sector. So it very well could be a much larger number. Um, what is what is also very concerning is um, the, within the bargaining council, what you have is within the metal industries bargaining council is the provision for companies to work what is called short time. And that's where, because of production challenges, you then can reduce your working week that we're reducing your employment cost. And what, what we are seeing is that 33% um, of companies are saying they're working short time. So basically that would be, and, and when we look at the numbers, they say they're working anything on average between three to four days of a work week. Um, and, and, and of those 33% of companies that have, that have um, implemented short time, um, and 16% or call it 17% have already um, cut uh, employment and then um, and then also a number of them also 17 percent have not cut employment but are working short time and what we've seen historically when we look at these stats is that uh, short time is a very good leading indicator for for potential job losses in, in in the system so unemployment also very very alarming trends coming out of there the other area we looked at is investment and the historic stats here 
show that investment into the economy has not kept up uh, or net investment into the economy um, has not ha ha has been on the decline. Maybe let me put it that way. And what we see is a, a deterioration of the fixed capital stock because net investment has not been um, 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 sufficient to keep up to that um, uh, de depreciation of, of, the, of the fixed capital stock. So already we see limited, a, a limited degree of investment coming into the sector for reasons that I've mentioned earlier on, a lack of demand in the system and just the general challenging economic environment. So the, the stats on investment have already not looked um, promising and then the impact from this load shedding impact assessment, what the question was to, to the member company, to the companies that responded, have you had to cancel uh, shelf ready projects that were that were that, that were either um, approved already by investment committees or at least on the shelf and ready to be deployed have you had have you cancelled um uh, investment projects because of the deteriorating outlook on the uh, as a result of the energy crisis maybe let me put it that way again the bearing in mind another absolute numbers those 200 companies indicated 2.64 2.64 billion rand of investment that they have cancelled, um, and call it just half of them, half of the sample size actually uh, said yes, they have cancelled uh, investment projects. Um, that's at 42 percent, and that value is 2.6 billion rand. The potential jobs that would have been created from those uh, investments that have been cancelled are 1,620. So again, another concerning trend. What was also interesting is when we looked at the split of investments that were cancelled, you see very little greenfield uh, investment, again, which talks to the broader challenging economic environment that what was on the shelf for greenfield is only about 3%. Um, um, more expansion type investment was your brownfield, 41%. Um, and then um, what we see as the major um, 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 uh, Attribute uh, the major, um, the major investment area was sustaining capital, so machinery, equipment, etc. But I guess uh, the split actually uh, means uh, little when one considers that it's been uh, these are investments that have been cancelled. What we then also look at is the impact to inflation. Uh, that's input cost inflation. That is um, input cost inflation. What we run internally is a is a um, um, input cost model, um, where we model through a, a, an aggregate index on 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 the impact to um, also on input costs. So what you see here, and I'll, this is sort of the structure of that uh, of that uh, model. Already, what you see is input costs running at about thirteen uh, percent, um, uh, which is double digit, and, and that's, that's quite aggressive. That's for the year. And what we see historically, so we measure that input cost inflation against selling price inflation. Um, selling price inflation in this case is PPI for intermediate manufactured goods um, because that measures factory gate prices. So we use that as a proxy for selling price inflation. And then we juxtapose that against uh, your, your input cost inflation that, that, we, that, we do, that we do structure. And um, um, what you do see historically is that there's been that negative carry historically when you look at uh, input costs versus um, uh, uh, selling price inflation. So again, concerning where, where it becomes important is because a number of the companies have deployed diesel generating capacity as alternative energy. What they are reporting is a 24% increase in monthly operating costs as a result of diesel generators, running diesel generators. And when we plug that into the, uh, the model, um, the last year on year number for the input cost inflation is actually 17.6%. So that 13 was an average for the year. The last reading in February, 2023 was 17.6%. And when you then factor in this um, response in terms of the input to input costs that pushes up the the, the input cost by about 1.7 percentage points to 19. So quite a considerable impact to, 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 to um, costs, largely because of the running of diesel generators, which then leads me to my uh, second last slide. And that's really, um, I won't dwell too much on this, but it was quite important to 
understand where the investments in alternative energy sources are going into. The companies, these 206 companies reported having have spent a billion rand on alternative energy sources over that period. And the majority of that is going into diesel generators. Again, it's a function of the load that these companies require. And the intermittent nature of renewable energies in the form of solar um, is not necessarily sufficient to power their needs. So generators are then the, the pre preferred um, method or the most practical method. And by and the implication of that, of course, is that increases to a generating um, uh, monthly operating costs. Um, also there, um, as, as you'll see from these companies, they've got 160 megawatts of installed capacity and solar only 32%. So that shows us the split of the alternative energy sources. So really in conclusion, I mentioned the fact that this is a binding constraint on the economy, makes sense. We are very actively involved as CIFSA um, through BUSA as well, as well as directly as CIFSA in the, in the um, various uh, discussions and, and interventions around energy. And we've just listed some there, but we do think that fast tracking PV installation at residential does relieve the load um, from a base load capacity, that, which then can be then um, 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 directed at manufacturers who need that base load capacity. And um, we also think there's a real opportunity around demand side management, particularly in aggregating those loads that are below the three MVA level. We think there's a real opportunity in there. And also we, we, we think that the installed diesel capacity and the opportunity for, uh, for manufacturers to plug that back into the grid um, is a potential. We actually learned last week from ESCOM that there is an active program where we're uh, manufacturers can do that. So we also think that really these are low areas of low hanging fruit um, while we try to resolve the coal fleet. So um, um, so I'll cut I'll cut it there. That is pretty much my presentation. I hope I didn't go too much over time. But uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to carry on because it was really interesting and useful insights. Um, and I think it gives us pause for thought on the serious implication, um, just in terms of the investment to job numbers. And the worrying thing is investments that either don't happen or are diverted to um, putting in diesel or um, renewables means that your productive capacity in the long term is, is going to be impacted. So this what's happening now has a long term implication. Uh, for, for manufacturing capacity because decisions taken now will impact on the next couple of years. So, um, so some, some things that we really, really need to get our heads around and I think some good solutions proposed. I'm hoping that other presenters will also come with some useful insights and uh, some policy recommendations. Okay, let me hand over to our next speaker, which is Silas. Um, Silas, do you want to unmute and drop your presentation? There we go. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and good morning, um, colleagues. My name is Silas Mazu from Salga. Um, Chair, can you confirm if um, you can hear me? And can you confirm if my slides is on slideshow? Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm going to um, give a presentation on the impact of load shedding on municipal finances as well as um, services. Um, it is a survey that we recently um, conducted um, from all um, 164 licensed distributors as well as um, 144 water services authorities. Um, it's not going to take that long, Chair. I'm going to basically introduce the subject um, and the purpose of the survey. I'll touch on how we um, collected the data and some of the preliminary findings. They are preliminary because we are still um, verifying some of the figures. We are still um, yeah, um, checking some of the data we received and yeah, soon we'll have the final report. And I will therefore conclude. Um, Chair, just to acknowledge um, the previous speaker at Afazo in terms of the impact of load shedding on the economy, um, that is quite, um, we're mindful of that and um, it's quite an insight in terms of, you know, the severity of the load shedding in the um, economy. Similarly, uh, from Salga, we are basically mindful of the um, um, impact of, of load shedding in the economy, in the small businesses and yeah, many others. But of course, this stems from the fact that uh, energy is the crux of economic growth and development. Without um, energy, there wouldn't be any development, meaning that every development also is being to energy. 
And certainly, um, electricity is the lifeblood of economic development. Without electricity, uh, the economy um, suffers a lot. And we are aware that uh, the load shedding at this point in time is costing uh, the country more than 1 billion rand a day. Um, and it is true that yeah, this load shedding is actually one of the biggest um, um, constraint on sufficient economic growth. And lots of uh, jobs are lost, um, a lot of revenue incomes are lost on a daily basis for as long as uh, we have got load shedding every day. So as SALGA, our South African Local Government Association, we are uh, greatly concerned about um, the current electricity generation capacity challenges. And um, we have noticed that it is actually leading to excessive load shedding, which um, so far, has lasted for um, over two years as we speak. And that's a huge concern, Chair. And um, we acknowledge these um, challenges that we face and we also acknowledge the um, reasons for the challenge as advanced all over in the media by ESCOM and also by the Minister of Electricity. Uh, we are actually saying that uh, the um, strategy of incentivizing the paying customers to seek for alternative options uh, for the energy needs is uh, most likely to have negative impacts in the medium to long term, specifically referring to the um, incentivization of the 25% of solar PV for commercial and um, uh, residential customers that yes, it, so, it, it seeks to solve the current challenge of shortage of generation capacity, but we're mindful of the fact that uh, in the medium to long term, it may have um, severe impact in the um, um, revenue of the municipalities as um, these paying customers um, may, um, some of them may go off grid, which is a concern where the uh, distributors will be left with uh, non-paying customers, which are mainly um, low income households. Um, load shedding has had an overall um, negative impact in the country and in the municipalities. We've heard from the, safe, 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 um, from the previous speaker, and um, it's not only in terms of that, um, also on the uh, distributor side in municipalities, um, there are additional expenditures that are being incurred as a result of the damage um, and vandalism of, vandalism, vandalism of infrastructure, theft of electricity, and um, issues around the overtime that we incur every now and then when there is um, load shedding, when there's a need to restore electricity in different parts of the country. So in essence, where did this start? This actually start um, when our um, NEC, Salga National Executive Committee, uh, took a resolution that uh, we need to um, drill deeper to get a better understanding of the severity of this impact um, of load shedding in the economy, in the municipalities, um, and so as to have um, yeah, better understanding on how severe it is and um, how can this be mitigated. And that's where we then um, uh, started to conduct this survey on the impact of load shedding. So what are we aiming at here is that uh, we, we, we say survey that we've conducted, which is actually aiming at assessing the impact of load shedding in both the uh, municipal finances, uh, the infrastructure um, that we own as local government, as well as the water um, um, wastewater treatment works facilities, as well as water purification facilities, but specifically, um, we're aiming at uh, quantifying the revenue losses due to unsaved energy. You will know that uh, when there's no electricity, we can't sell electricity, and certainly we do lose um, a lot of revenue. Um, the cost that we're incurring every now and then as a result of uh, theft and vandalism, uh, the extra security that uh, we um, have hired in order to safeguard our infrastructure, and um, the um, staff over time, um, as well as uh, contractors that uh, we um, happen to um, call them every now and then due to the um, load shedding. And of course, the cost of using gen, uh, fuel, uh, gen set, um, the for the wastewater treatment works and uh, to ultimately come up with some you know, short, medium and long-term solutions to alleviate this um, challenge. Not gonna waste time on this. It's actually methodology or how we've done it is that uh, we have uh, developed questionnaire and circulated it to all the uh, local government, the municipalities across the country. We did receive 89 responses from a mixture of uh, municipalities ranging from metros uh, to smaller municipalities, some licensed municipal distributors, others were water services authority. Then we analyzed the data and then we came up with uh, preliminary findings. I'm not going to um, also uh, share this. It's basically the responses that we received from different municipalities across the country. 
Uh, but let's, let's, having said that, let's now turn our attention to um, the preliminary findings that uh, we have um, found at this point in time after analysis of the data. Um, we, we have noticed that uh, the frequency and intensity of um, um, cable theft and vandalism of infrastructure um, have uh, severely increased ever since we have had uh, this load shedding on a daily basis. Some municipalities wake up uh, to record as high as over 100 incidents of vandalism and theft of cables. So that's how rough it is as we speak, um, precisely because um, thieves do know the load shedding schedule that is communicated with the public. They do know the two hours of load shedding in a particular area, and hence the vandalism and uh, theft is actually rife. Um, 12% of these um, um, incidents were actually incidents that were over 100 um, per load shedding per day. Then around 48% were incidents that were recorded at less than 10 incidents per day per load shedding. So by virtue of even 12% of these incidents that are over 100 per day per load shedding per municipality, it does uh, show how rife the theft and vandalism is um, as a result of load shedding. Um, and then the, the number of equipments that are being vandalized and stolen in, on a daily basis. But uh, we've noticed that 25% of this uh, theft and vandalism is actually um, cables that are theft, uh, that are stolen rather. Um, and then 23% is actually transformers and the rest of other percentages are for other electrical equipment that are being uh, stolen and vandalized on a daily basis uh, when there is load shedding um, in different parts of the municipalities. Um, over and above that, we do um, replace um, equipment that are um, uh, damaged um, mainly due to excessive switching, uh, because you'll know that electrical infrastructure are not designed for frequent switching. We do also replace and repair equipment that are stolen and vandalized. Um, and um, municipalities um, are spending over um, 1.5 billion um, rand per um, financial year. Actually, the real figure that we estimate for all licensed municipal distributors is actually uh, goes beyond 3 uh, billion rand that is being spent. These are uh, funds that were never budgeted for because this is precisely what is being replaced or repaired as a result of uh, theft as well as vandalism. Um, looking at some of the pictures, anyway, I'm not going to uh, waste time on this. These are uh, uh, things that uh, we um, wake up almost on a daily basis, um, finding in our infrastructure, vandalism and theft, um, cables that are dug um, underground um, on a daily basis in different municipalities. Um, and yeah, these are cables that were basically dug. You can see that uh, the digging here is actually professionally done. This not, uh, these are not uh, chances. Um, and it does show that this work that might, is a work that might also be done by some other equipment as opposed to a normal spade. Uh, but anyway, this is how rife uh, theft and vandalism is as a result of load shedding. And of course, we acknowledge that uh, the cable theft has been there before load shedding. But ever since there has been load shedding, it is abnormally high. So looking at the wastewater treatment facilities, um, we, we have realized that uh, municipalities are spending a lot of money in uh, repairing infrastructures that are um, yeah, destroyed, that are vandalized. Um, almost um, half of a billion rand um, has been spent um, in uh, this financial year uh, to repair and replace the damaged um, infrastructure. Uh, normally, that is a, that's something that is okay during the, the load shedding. And um, of almost um, half of a billion rand uh, was basically spent on the procurement of um, backup genset. We know that uh, um, the wastewater treatment works uh, will need um, power to operate. And these are facilities that operate 24 seven and so we have no choice but, but uh, procuring the gensets as a backup to ensure that um, these facilities remain operational even during um, load shedding. And um, we then, yes, as I said, have almost half of a billion for gensets. Um, and again, um, half of a, um, a billion again for um, a fuel. Um, as we know that genset will basically need fuel and a total of uh, um, 1.5 billion rand um, has been spent for both uh, repair of equipment in the wastewater treatment facilities, procurement of genset, which is once off, and of course, um, um, gens uh, a fuel for genset, uh, which is on, on a daily basis. And this is actually for 75 
out of 144 water services authorities. So our estimation, um, as we are still confirming some of the figures and finalizing our assumptions, is that uh, the local government is spending over 3.5 billion rand per annum um, for the um, uh, wastewater treatment um, facilities, which this is all um, happening because of load shedding. So the um, revenue that we're losing as a result of uh, what called load shedding is called unsaved energy. By definition, it's actually a value as a rent per kilowatt hour that is placed on a unit, unit of a kilowatt hour of energy not supplied uh, to customers due to um, an unplanned outage or, or load shedding. So a lot of um, money that uh, we are losing on a daily basis when there's load shedding um, from the 65 license municipal distributors, um, the uh, revenue that is being lost is over 10 billion rand uh, per annum. Um, then we needed to then determine that in terms of metros, in terms of local municipalities and the total loss for all municipal distributors. So out of these 65, uh, five were metros and 60 were local municipalities. Uh, the five metros, um, the, the loss, the data they gave as a loss due to unsaved energy, 3.9 billion rand, and we average this by the five metros to get an average loss per metro, which then uh, came down to 795 million rand per metro per annum. And you then multiply this by a total of eight metros. So a total of uh, 6.4 billion from the metros um, is being lost on um, every year due to unsaved energy. So to be specific, it's around uh, 6 billion 361 million rand for metros. Um, this varies from one metro to another. As you know, that they've got different NMDs, notified maximum demands. Um, cities such as Ekurleni, Jobek, they're losing a, you know, around 1.4 billion uh, per annum. And of course, um, Jobek, uh, Buffalo City, as well as Cape Town is uh, slightly uh, less than what uh, the Ekurleni and Chinas are losing. So again, coming to local governments, uh, sorry, to the local municipalities, um, which are 60 of them, that gave the data of uh, loss of uh, over 6 billion. Um, we then divided this by total of um, uh, the number of these um, 60 local municipalities. Uh, it came down to an average of around um, 114 um, million rand per local municipality. And uh, we've got 156 of them as a local municipalities licensed uh, service providers. Uh, uh, then it then the figure the loss is around 17 billion rand that uh, local uh, municipalities are actually losing as a result of load shedding or unsaved energy. Total for both local municipalities as well as metropolitan municipalities, it goes to around um, or over 24 billion rand uh, that we're losing as a result of load shedding. Then this excludes some unquantified losses of customers that are, as we speak, going off grid. And of course, partial loss for customers that are installing embedded generation that cuts across both commercial, local uh, households, commercial as well as industrial that are installing uh, solar PV as we speak today. That's another partial loss, which we are yet to quantify that. Um, I'm not gonna waste time on this. This is actually a situation where the private security, where we are private security because the theft and vandalism rate is quite abnormal then there is a need to um, um, hire extra security. Uh, we're spending over half of a billion rand for private security. And of course, um, to also um, staff over time, uh, because it's abnormally high, uh, staff members, electricians, and yeah, so on, are actually always working almost 24 seven, as we know that we need to restore electricity every now and then. Uh, so we are actually incurring over uh, 1.1 billion for both uh, private security as well as um, staff over time. Um, just an example of some of the Minix are actually not spending any cent, uh, which we, we, we they find a way of managing over time, such as KSD, which they limit their hours for uh, to 40 hours, Rassenberg shift over shift um, uh, system, and yeah, many other municipalities, but a lot of them do um, spend um, a lot of money on uh, staff uh, compliments to work over time. So, we recommend that municipalities need to budget extra 50% uh, because we know that load shedding is still going to be with us um, for the next at least 24 months or so. Um, now looking at the impact of load shedding, uh, rather the, what are the short, medium and um, long term, uh, some of the solutions suggested by municipalities. Uh, we're running out of time, um, let me try to wrap up quickly, thanks. 
Okay, no, thank you very much. Yes, um, in two minutes, I will be done here. The um, interventions that include what we see on a daily basis, implementation of embedded generation, but the most um, short-term one is the procurement of gensets and um, the demand side management, as uh, Tafazwa mentioned this, which I'm not gonna waste time on this. Um, in terms of impact, um, this, I'm not gonna list this. Uh, we've seen uh, the losses, job losses and business and all those kind of things that uh, Tafazwa mentioned, which I'm not gonna waste time on that. But uh, um, in the core, we do have a lot of uh, businesses that are closing down. Um, we have a lot of uh, loss of revenue dif from different businesses. Um, job losses, um, which is a daily phenomenon, uh, loss of uh, production hours and many other impacts that uh, the load shedding is causing in the business, including criminality, as FAGs um, do capitalize when there's load shedding. So in conclusion, um, Chair, is that uh, this loss um, is that we're incurring is, is actually um, unaffordable um, and highly unsustainable. Uh, we initially plan to identify the areas of support uh, so that we can access funds from the national disaster, um, specifically regulations 4E, but uh, we are mindful of the fact that it has been withdrawn as we speak. Um, fortunately, so far, there is no uh, framework against which uh, the application can be made for financial assistance. Nevertheless, um, we are going to lobby uh, the provincial uh, COCTA um, across all provinces uh, so that they can provide support to the um, municipalities in many ways. And of course, um, the NECOM Workstream 9, National Electricity Crisis Committee Workstream 9, it deals with the distribution. And we're mindful of the uh, substream that deals with safety and security, which SAPS is part of that. And we believe it's gonna help us a lot in terms of uh, um, reducing this um, theft and vandalism that is actually costing municipalities a lot of money. Thank you very much, Chairperson. That was my last slide. That really gives us some useful insights into so, some of the very deep problems that our municipalities are facing. The, uh, yeah, the, the high cost of vandalism, the, the impact on municipal finances, and possibly the need for a different uh, business model for municipalities and how they can, can try and make money from, from people selling electricity. I think that's something um, that, that would need to come through. Um, but yeah, there, there's there's a lot of things that are pointing to some, some deep challenges, and and again the, the long term impact on decisions made. So um, if municipalities are worried about electricity availability, they may decline building plans or um, new infrastructure coming on stream. So so these then have a long term knock on effect um, on on industrial capacity, and and all of this. Um, as a long-term impact um, or current impact on manufacturing firms. The, the longer outages because of the vandalism, the lack of water availability or treatment of water um, has an impact on, on how firms can operate and what they can do. So um, yeah, thank you very much for those insights and an and understanding of the costs um, that municipalities are facing. I'm now handing over to Neva Makhetna, Okay, so um, I mean, what I kind of would like to hope this will do is try and pull together some of the kids. Sure. Sorry. Well, so the, the okay, so, so what I wanted to talk about was the, um, in effect, that given all these costs, we need some way of reconceptualizing our strategy on um, load shedding if we want to get to some place that is in line with our industrial policy. That, um, we really need a new conceptual framework. And so the first slide is just giving a sense of the extraordinary increase in the magnitude, magnitude of load shedding in the past year, at least according to CSIR data. One of the problems is various different sources give quite different data on this, which is a bit disconcerting. Um, but it's hard, what has come up from these surveys, it's, it's hard to measure the costs um, for a couple of reasons. One is that the costs do spread across businesses, households, and municipalities as preferred. And in effect, that's because as well as, and to some extent, national treasury are externalizing their costs. So the things they have to do to fix load shedding, they bear the cost directly on their budget. But if they load shed, all the rest of us bear the cost, and they don't have, it, it doesn't affect them as directly. But what that means is you have many, many different actors, and it's actually quite hard to conceptualize the cost. And to, to come up with a figure that would then justify greater investment, more diesel, all of those things that could 
fast track distribution on the chain. But the second problem is a lot of the cost opportunity costs. So as we've heard, there's work on demand, right? Because it's not just manufacturing, but services also say so people don't go out as much when there's low check. There's, um, so there's lower sales, there's lower investment, but something they haven't talked so much is that the flight of not just investors, but also skills. So, you know, I think quite a lot of people who are able to go elsewhere because they have the qualifications, um, this is, I suspect we're going to see it become more of an issue because it is just so profoundly disconcerting when the electricity system doesn't work in the way you're used to. And there's also a loss to say, a further loss, I could say, of stakeholder trust. So it requires that stakeholders work together for the greater good. Obviously, something like bone shedding is breaking that trust for many people. Right. Yes. So the part of the question is, what are we trying to fix? And I would argue that our the, the strategy to date, the net hump strategy that we've heard about, is really saying we have to fix the national grid. And then the critical thing to do that is we have to get more generation capacity feeding into the national grid, and we have to fix S hump. And we know that'll take a couple of years, but that's like that's the technology and the resources we have. But an alternative approach would say, no, the problem is that we need to have inclusive industrialization, that the economic structures we have are excessively dependent on mining and excessively unequal. Okay. <laughs> um, and in effect, that's why we say we need an industrial policy is because of those systemic and structural problems that we need to fix. And from that standpoint, what we need to have is a response to load shedding that yet protects producers from the kinds of costs we've been hearing about, but particularly also protects small business and self-employed people and protects working, community, working class communities because inclusive industrialization, firstly, it's definitional, but secondly, you can't have an industrial policy that's sustainable in a very unequal democracy if you don't meet the needs of the majority. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say, and, and so that's stuff we could do immediately in the interim. Having said that, of course, how we do it, as we've heard, will also affect the long-term structure of the electricity system. So there's an interplay between these two factors. If we get enough off-grid electricity coming in, um, then the national electricity system has to change because demand will go down through some of these very good projects that we have already invested in. And um, the one thing I want to flag is that I found quite interesting. Yeah, is that when we did the COVID-19 response, it was very explicitly about the need to protect working people and, and small business. Mm -hmm. And we're not actually seeing that at all in this strategy. And I think, I hate to say it, I think that has a lot to do with two things. One is that that was the international paradigm, which took the burden off our people made doing something innovative. But the other problem is that um, there was much less pushback on that because everybody knew it was a crisis. Whereas on this one, you've got the coal system and ESCOM and as we've heard in municipalities, very deeply afraid that the kinds of changes we have to make in the electricity system to relieve business and households cuts into their revenues in various ways. Yeah. Um, so realizing we need two paradigm shifts. One is that we're in the middle of the technological change nationally and internationally in the energy system. You know, we talk about the energy transition but it takes on a life of its own. It's not now just because of climate change. It is simply cheaper to use renewable energy now. Um, and there's a reason that most countries, we use about uh, seven times as much coal as the average for upper middle income countries. And that's because other systems are actually cheaper if you can do them. Yeah. Um, and whenever you have a technological leap, you know, there's this concept of creative destruction where you are going to lose some things in order to get the advantages of that technology. And what you lose are the pre-existing technologies become obsolete while they're still possibly productive. And you have to decide, will you write them off or what are you going to do about that? And the jobs that go with them. But also you've got the systems in both the public and private sector that have to be very much disrupted and nobody actually likes disruption even though we all talk about it, it's a good thing. No? Um, and it's particularly challenging again, this, Technological transition in energy is really challenging for South Africa because we are so over-dependent on coal compared to other countries. So it's just for us, it's a bigger ship. And remember the coal really, you know, when you talk about the mineral energy complex, you're really talking about the coal value chain. So in many ways, it shaped our economy. 
Um, there are strategic responses that you always have when in these kinds of situations of a technological leap that has a big impact. You try and maximize the benefits from these new and more competitive and more productive, sometimes safer, whatever technologies and systems. You try and ensure a just transition in the sense that people who are poor, small businesses, people who don't have the resources to adapt, you help them adapt. Um, but you also accept that you're going to have to write off some systems and some assets. Yeah? And that's what people talk about the cost. That's largely what they're talking about. Um, but it does mean that the people who are deeply invested in those old systems, like I said, the coal mining companies, um, as common in the municipalities, they're going to lobby. You know, and it's not always so easy to say, actually, we think this is an irreversible transition. You know, like the Luddites in, the, in England thought they could reverse the transition, yeah? as it were. Um, my favorite urban myth, which turns out not to be true, is that the word saboteur comes from workers throwing their shoes in the machinery. Unfortunately, that's not where it comes from, but it's a great story. Um, but the second thing, like I said, is we have a deeply unequal democracy, and that means we have to think through what does industrial policy mean for South Africa? Because if industrial policy has any meaning, it's a tailor-made system that addresses the specific problems you have in your country in a relatively pragmatic way. It's very hard to find the definition of industrial policy, by the way. So, um, so you can't just say we have to grow and become more competitive. You can't just say we have to diversify away from commodities. You also have to say, how do we do that in a way that leads to a more equitable outcome? And that's particularly true because we are a democracy. And if you have a policy that doesn't benefit the majority, you're not going to get the support or resources you need to sustain those kinds of changes. And for South Africa, that means we actually have to do more to support small business and self-employment, both as users and suppliers of the new technology. So where we really lag behind unemployment is actually in self-employment because apartheid smashed peasant agriculture and black-owned businesses. And so the really big gap in employment in South Africa compared to other upper middle income countries is in self-employment, if you look at the ILO data. So they have like 20 to 30 percent of the population is self-employed, and we have like five to six percent. Part thing is some unique things. Um, and both users of the new technologies and suppliers of the new technologies in electricity, how do we ensure that they actually survive this transition, given that they don't have the resources often to, to support themselves? But also can they take advantage of these new um, opportunities that arise? It also means support for working class communities that can't afford the upfront course of cost of new technology because otherwise we are continuing to deepen the inequalities that already existed and that were made worse by the structure of job losses under COVID. And then finally, I would argue we really have to think about education and skills because honestly, there's such a high correlation between having basically a university degree will get you out of poverty in South Africa, not much else will do it. Then, um, and the question is, when we look at our response to load shedding, in effect, what we're saying is what, is what are strategies that will help us meet these imperatives as well, as well as adapting to the fact there is a technological change. We can't just say fix SCOM and everything will be just fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. So options for mitigating load shedding. The aim is to say, how do we maintain production and the quality of life? And really what we want is affordable energy during load shedding. And the one thing I want to flag, we get so focused on load shedding. We don't talk about the cost per kilowatt hour, which has more than doubled in real terms in the past decade. So you have an economy that was built on cheap coal, and coal is no longer cheap. And that also is very disruptive. So what is solar equipment? What is that we do other kinds of, of um, off-grid um, generation or storage? that are basically using the old technology, but in new ways, packaging and smaller, making it off grid, like generation or batteries. Yeah. Um, but it's not renewable. And what is, just to be clear, all of them need better installation capacity and skills. So um, you need both the inputs in the technology, but we don't talk so much about the need for people who can actually install it. Um, and there's been a huge surge in demand for all, both the technologies so both the equipment and the skills. And I don't see anything in place to say, how do we make sure the supply is there if you need it? And I understand the price, the cost in the past month of getting solar in your house is doubled. No, I've been told my people are trying. So 
These things all have some unique and different constraints. Solar equipment, the real constraint is it's very expensive upfront, as those of you know who have gotten solar. We just got solar for my entire flat. And I'm not going to tell you how much it costs. Luckily, we're not paying it. Because you have what it really means is when you have a very high cost for something, it will pay for itself over time, you should be able to get financed. But those systems are often not in place. So the really big blockage, I would argue, is besides the tech, just getting the technology and the skills, is that you need financing. There are opportunities for clean energy finance. Like for my class, it's being funded by some European carbon um, carbon trading firm. No? If you buy gas, diesel, what we've been hearing are batteries, the problem is they, they only pay for themselves to the extent they let you maintain production. But your energy costs per unit actually go up and not down. No? Or if you get an inverter, right, then you're not paying more, you're just using Pascal electricity. But you do have to pay for the equipment itself. No? But diesel, generator, diesel generators and gas at high energy cost are usually more expensive than electricity than grid electricity. It's a problem because at higher levels of load shedding, you also have more hours. So you end up as you know, in solar, you actually save more when load shedding goes up. Diesel, you actually spend more. Yeah. Um, and then obviously we need to talk about what are we going to do about installation capacity and skills? Because it's all very well to say if you have these choices of technology to be placed on national grid during load shedding and to mitigate these impacts, but somebody has to produce them and somebody has to install them. Okay, so some policy options. Treasury has already said they're going to give tax incentives to the value of about 9 billion rand, half for business, half for households. Um, and they're going to do credit guarantees, which is 8 billion. Couple of problems with this is it's not a big bank. That's the problem. And we need a big bank, obviously, as you've been hearing. Um, why? Well, firstly, the incentives, if you're too poor to get, or you don't have a good enough credit rating, or you don't have enough cash to get the actual upfront amount to pay for, the, you only get the tax incentive down the road. So it doesn't actually help you. And a lot of businesses are too small to actually pay income tax. Yeah? So like the vast majority of businesses don't pay any income tax at all. So then it doesn't help to say we're going to write it off your income tax. Um, and the same thing is true for households. And the thing about credit guarantees is um, that would help with the upfront financing, but the system's already in place even now. And, and it's really a question of how do you ensure that people can get the money quickly and easily. But also what we saw with the COVID loans, Sol and I have a fight about this, but the banks didn't actually change their criteria that much. So if you don't say what are the criteria that will let you get the loan, and you stick to the existing criteria, even with the guarantee, then the guarantee is not doing what it's supposed to do, which is make it easier to get the loan. Uh, the DPNC has also put aside 1.3 billion in IDC funding from experience that will be useful, but obviously 1.3 billion, you include the order of magnitude of these costs that people are already paying. It's not going to go very far. Yeah. Um, they're also planning to try and make it easier for people to go off grid. I don't think that's really relevant because it's with the kinds of off-grid that we're talking about. It's not that hard to do already. Yeah. And they want to localize inputs. So some challenges and possibilities in this context. There we go. Um, look, I would argue we need to put some packages, for, particularly for small business. From the standpoint of industrial policy, what you really need is it should be easy for people to get a package to install an off-grid solution. They can decide which kind. I mean, I think each solar, like I said, I think has the advantage of being cheaper in the long run, but it is a bigger upfront cost. And by the way, one thing I said if you get some in generators, part of that's legacy. Yeah? Like solar only became really affordable fairly recently, and you need the financing. But if you have the financing because the generation costs are low. It does pay for itself. And so I would argue that makes more sense besides the environmental concerns. Uh, but it has to be easily accessible and affordable, and you can do it directly, or you can do it through industrial. In effect, you come up with collective solutions when you say we'll put in a grid for an industrial site or a commercial site. And by the way, all the malls have them, but if you talk to your local you know, cafe on the corner, they probably don't. And that's a problem because their landlords don't do it. So I think that's what I mean by saying you have to roll it out more consistently for micro enterprise and small enterprise as well. I do think 
think we need a better understanding of the costs and benefits of solar and generators and storage for small businesses and households. Mm -hmm. Again, the timing of the cost is critical. If you have to pay a huge amount up front, like well over 100000 for a suburban house, maybe, yes, you'll get the money back over 10 years, but you may not be able to mobilize the money up front. Um, so even though it's cheaper in the long run, it doesn't help you very much. You just keep saying that. Um, we need to be more careful about the supply of input. So the supply chains are running into severe problems. We're not the only country where everybody is going for solar. Yeah. And we're running, you know, we import a lot of this equipment. It's simply not available very quickly. And like, I'm hearing from the guys who did our flight, they're running out of like just basic, you know, stuff they can always get in the past, like small transformers and things they can't get. Yeah. And fuse boxes and stuff like that, because everybody is doing this all at once. So I would argue one thing that industrial policy should be doing is anticipating that need and saying, how can we meet that need? Having said that, that doesn't necessarily mean overproduction. If there are trade-offs, and we've seen that particularly with solar, that if you don't have the capacity in place at the start, how much should we play, you know, what is the better for an effective industrialization strategy to get that particular product produced locally or to facilitate production across the economy? That's something we would have to look at. Yeah? But I think we have to be upfront about the trade-offs. We could also just try and speed up imports, but also these for households in the informal sector, like inverters, batteries, just even battery run lights. That I suspect everybody in this house, this building, in this room now has a small collection of battery run lights. But if you're if you're living on a social branch, you can't afford that. You know, and it makes a huge difference. And then finally, the issue is the intermediation systems as well as the source. Again, it's a crisis. Can we fast track it? But also there are collective options like municipal generation, industrial and commercial sites. Um, and then there's issues of can we access green financing to make all of this viable? And then finally, just to say, we do need to think about the end state for the national and the municipal electricity suppliers we heard. So on the one hand, you don't want this to just push up the cost for users and taxpayers because what ESCON does is say all our costs are fixed. If demand goes down, we have to pay the prices higher. So as people go off grid, they put up their prices even faster. Yeah. But also the municipalities have a history of being the actually only the metros and a few secondary cities have used a surplus of electricity to pay for other things. Yeah. Most, oh yeah, it's been going on forever, but most of the smaller cities don't make enough off electricity to do that, and none in historic every seven years. So you can break it down, Tracy gives you the data. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's really a metro thing, but guess who has the biggest voice um, when it comes to municipalities? Um, but so how do you manage that restructuring of finances? How do you manage a long run declining demand for ESCOM? All of those issues. How do we think about that? How do you come up with an energy system that is able to weave together these much more diverse sources and come up with this reliable and affordable supply for everybody, not just for people who can afford, you know, their very own little solutions? Okay, so what I, just to say, sorry, one last slide I'm here to say, that we, basically just to sum up, we need a paradigm shift so that we look at load shedding as part of a broader structural change, some of which we can't avoid, like the technological change, some of which is what we aspire to. That means we need much larger and faster measures to support business, including emerging businesses and small enterprises, as well as working class communities. And we have to be aware that we may end up with a lot of second best solutions. And we have to have, find some way to talk about that. So it might mean more converters as opposed to solar, just because they're cheaper upfront. Huh? Okay, we're on the ball. That's a long time on some very useful presentation for great insights. No, it's fine. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, and thank you to the other two speakers. I'm going to open up for questions. I know Tafatwa has a hard exit because he's going to a board meeting. So if there are questions either in the room or virtually, uh, please raise your hand um, either way and then introduce yourself. I'll take those in the room first. Good uh, afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my name is Nkrano Mungoe, I'm from the Mining Equipment Manufacturers of South Africa. My question is to uh, my colleague from Salva Salas. In Ivan I think both of you touched on the issue of training 
and nowhere in your presentation, Salas, where you mentioned the issue of training and skills, because one thing we we see is we're discussing uh, some of the challenges with the likes of the career is firstly getting the, the right skills to go into some of these uh, electrical departments, but also retention. So I just wanted to find out what is your plan as SARC to assist municipalities to get the right skills and retain those skills. Thank you. Um, this is a question I'll, I'll, anybody can answer this, I don't mind. Um, this has been ongoing now for at least 36 months. Last year we had the highest volume of um, load shedding. But one thing that I keep noticing and it's happening a lot is I feel as though we're working in silos. Um, so private sector is working one way, um, renewable industries are working this way, um, the banks are going that way, government's going this way, and even within government itself. Um, Salka is not talking to environment, environment is not talking to energy. So I feel as though also we're moving around in dysfunctional square circles here. Um, therefore, we're not really getting any tangible output and the results. Second thing I also feel is that we don't have a containment strategy for load sharing. Um, and that's also why it's sort of impacting so vastly on different industries. I would like to know, um, anybody can answer this who's presented, what are some of the best practices from our counterparts in, let's say, India, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, um, other countries? Impactful energy crisis, but what are the people doing that right? Um, as Lynn was saying, a lot of the solutions need to be combined with consumer small businesses and households. So what are people doing in the immediate sense there that we can copy, cut, and paste? I mean, you're never telling us that, I mean, no offense, no, if you're getting more green energy from some European firm, um, I'm not sure that's going to happen in Mamiloji, um, where it needs to be taking place. Yes, so um, I need to understand when we're saying also for Salga, for Munis, that we want to bring an IPPs on board, I mean, are you going to be buying electricity from the shacks in Sosri Ube, Extension 7? I mean, what are we doing here? Um, that's my query. Okay, so there's a question. It said, are there structured interventions to allow security efforts between business forums and municipalities in terms of guarding electrical infrastructure? Um, okay, let me um, ask um, each of the presenters just to give a two-minute response. Um, Tafatswa, I'll start with you. Also, if you want to comment on anything that the other presenters have mentioned. That, thanks a lot, uh, Saul. I appreciate the, uh, the the questions and the indulgence uh, um, with my needing to step off. I think the very uh, valid point was made by, um, sorry, I didn't catch a name, uh, the, the, the last speaker from UJ um, around the silo, uh, everything happening in silos. And that's one thing that's been repeatedly um, 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 identified as we then either have contradictory um, initiatives or initiatives where um, they are ad hoc in nature in terms of uh, how they are implemented, which is actually not a working model. But something that was picked up last week, um, we had through BUSA an engagement at, uh, at, at uh, ESCOM or with ESCOM. And I think this NECOM structure, the National Energy Crisis Committee, um, granted, it's been criticized for taking too long in terms of delivering interventions, but that does present a vehicle for a coordinated uh, approach. In fact, in this discussion that we had last week at ESCOM, the idea was that even at the interventions at ESCOM level, those should be structured along the NECOM, uh, NECOM, um, NECOM uh, work groups. And I think that's really something because it does offer us a platform to engage. It also has um, ears all the way up to the presidency, which gives it that necessary, the necessary teeth and necessary attention to the highest office. So I think, from bringing all the initiatives under one house, I think that's one area. And the last thing I would say on that, and we've repeatedly said this historically, that for, for the private sector participation in that NECOM, it needs to be very, um, it, it needs to be genuine uh, private sector participation in the sense that it can't be notional. So to the extent that the private sector is on the table, at the table um, and, and offering solutions, they should be allowed to do that without any restriction. Um, yeah, so I think that was one point, Saul, that I thought was very valid from what was mentioned and how we view it from a coordinating the activities. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Silas, um, do you want to respond to any of the questions? Thank you very much. Yes, um, the first question around the skills. Um, yes, we're mindful of that. We are well aware that uh, 
the, the skills gap um, in many municipalities. Um, well, a number of metros do have sufficient, well, not sufficient, do have some skills, but uh, when it comes to many other mun smaller municipalities, yes, there is a shortage of that. So I wanted to draw the attention of uh, a colleague who asked about skills that, yes, we, we have mentioned it here that indeed there is a skills deficiency in many municipalities. One, how we're addressing that, one, a lot of capacity building work that we do with uh, um, our partners, donor funders, such as GIZ, um, such as um, Southern Africa um, um, Energy Program, which is sponsored by USAID. Um, we're doing a lot of work around, um, yes, training them around, um, and we're thankful of the fact that uh, the managers reporting to municipal managers now are basically permanent, no longer five-year term, because that used to be a challenge in terms of uh, uh, retention of, of the skills. So that's how we, we, we are dealing with the skills as, as, as is. Um, the question around um, working in silo, um, I think uh, the, yeah, there are several um, uh, um, platforms that have been established, one of them being um, the NICOM, which I won't mention that, but uh, we, we do meet um, business and uh, many other stakeholders in the network. Uh, to discuss these matters, we do need we do meet uh, the IPPs and other stakeholders in the embedded generation task team that is provided by the presidency, so as to ensure that uh, the uh, barriers uh, bottlenecks are basically dealt with at that level, and as well as NICOM that has been mentioned, experience uh, with other countries that have dealt with uh, load shedding, because um, the nature of our country, the population, the capacity we have differ from one country to another. Um, but we're mindful of the fact that uh, Vietnam is one of the examples that I think there's been many scholars that looked at which how they address their load shedding challenge or generation of shortage of generation of capacity was through what we call feeding tariff, where the solar PV is now contributing a lot and it made significant contribution in um, addressing uh, the load shedding. But there are many more other countries that have dealt with load shedding. I'll just give an example with Vietnam. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I just to say, but most other countries do better, which is they always have an essential budget. You know, particularly lower income countries. Yeah? So people, have, you talk to people from Nigeria or Pakistan, they've always had generated. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And even in places, mm -hmm. some parts of other things. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I think that we, we don't really understand that well enough, but we always had a system that was incredibly centralized because it only served, you know, 10% of the population. And then when they, spread it out, they did much worse quality. By the way, that's not what put the strain on the grid. I'm just right. saying, we didn't have that tradition of being self-sufficient in energy. And we're not kind of patched up with it in that sense. Um, in terms of working class communities, I mean, that's the whole point. They, they, what we're doing is setting up a system where you deepen the inequalities you already have because people can afford it and can get off grid. And people who can't, we have nothing for them. And I do think that the many groups of municipalities and communities is one way of getting there because then they can't get the financing in a way that an individual cannot. But honestly, at one point I was just saying, why don't we just at least give everybody a you know one of those battery powered lights? You know, that everybody who has a social plan gets a battery powered light or so. You know, and it, it gets a bit pricey because so many people live off social plans, but it makes such a big difference. And that is the way of going off there. No? Okay, um, in terms of the municipal security stuff, the one thing I'm saying is there is also a tax team on cable theft. They did be looking at this. Huh? But part of the problem is that, you know, if load shedding is leading to such a big increase, that's offsetting those measures um, that also will take a while to become more effective. And then the one thing I'd say about NETCOM, this is my problem, is that the NETCOM strategy, NETCOM was really set up and sees its strategy, as I understand it, as we need to fix the national grid. And they're doing very, very, you know, they say they want to fast track. The only thing they have is they want to accelerate what they call rooftop solar. But it's a relatively small part of their work. And the only practical step they reported on that is that they're working on regulations precisely for things like feed in tariffs. But, you know, it's not just the tariff. It's also the technology. You need to have the right kinds of meters. And the municipalities need to be able to change their revenue, you know, their expenditure structure where they've always just paid ESCOM. They need to then go to the rooftop meters and who knows how much money they'll make off that. So I think that um, the fact is, I personally think that that could be a very, and it's a, you know, we're serious about fast tracking things. I think the line of the rooftop meters is just, on the feeding tariff is a bit problematic. Okay, thank you. Um, we have hit the end of our scheduled time and I see people are dropping off, but if there are any um, 
more comments. Um, Asita Patwa has uh, been needed to head off to his meeting. Um, there is one more question online. Okay, just a concern around um, municipalities. Uh, it's more of a comment. Um, and then um, some more comments um, around the safety and security issues. Okay. Um, are there any more questions in the room or online? Otherwise, we will close. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any hands online and I'm not seeing any hands in the room. So thank you, everyone. Um, we, we haven't run over um, and there has been some um, discussion in the chat um, as well. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Just to say, TIPS is going to be doing more work on this space. We, we're looking at uh, further research to better understand the challenges, to look at the impacts of um, the incentive and um, some of the requirements. Um, so so we'll, we'll continue to um, engage um, with the, the relevant uh, business associations, industry, and with government on some of our research outputs. Thank you everyone for attending in person and virtually, and hope you enjoy your afternoon. Those who are here in person, there's lunch at the back. Thanks everyone. And thank you to the two speakers for your time. Thank you.